Well, good morning, Willington Church. It's wonderful to see you all today. Welcome as we begin our service together. I invite you, let's stand. As we begin our time of worship and praying and listening to the Word of God today, I want to start us out with Psalm 113 that says this, Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed is the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Praise the Lord. Can we say that together? Praise the Lord. Come on, let's say it one more time. Praise the Lord. Now, why don't you greet one another as we begin our time of worship and praising the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, no matter what, no matter what season you receive. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, whose streams of the abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when found in the desert. I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the dark
You're the God of covenant and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds will blow, I will live in fast and live my heart away.
Father, for how you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to be our friend, to be our savior, to be our Lord, to be that perfect sacrifice that bridged the gap between us and you when we fell away in sin, when we walked according to our own ways and not yours. God, thank you for your mercy and your grace that you would call us by name back to yourself. Thank you, Father, that we can trust in your promises. Thank you that we can bless your name and trust you, whether we are on a mountain or in the valley. Lord, we believe that you are our sovereign God, worthy of our worship and praise, almighty, everlasting. So we praise you, we worship you. And as we continue in worship, not just through singing, but also witnessing baptisms and hearing testimonies of how you move and how you work, to God be the glory great things you have done. So we give you this time. We give you our attention. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen.
Amen. Well, why don't you take a seat and we will watch those testimonies and celebrate baptisms together. When I look out over this vast ocean, I'm urged to dive down to its unplumbed depths, be immersed in its underwater wonder, explore the beauty of the ocean floor and be carried by the power of its currents. It is grander, more unfathomable, wider and deeper than anything I can imagine. When baptized, I am immersed in someone greater, more majestic and more beautiful than anyone I could ever comprehend. I'm invited into the sacred fellowship of the Father, the Son and the Spirit. That's why Jesus says I'm baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When I'm baptized, I'm saying yes to life with God and no to my sin-bound, independent ways. I'm saying I've been reborn, I have new life, and now, by trusting God, I will follow Jesus. I embark on this journey of following in His footsteps, learning to live as He would have me live, becoming like Him, doing what He would do by the power and joy of the Spirit. When I'm baptized, I'm saying something to the world around me. I'm one with Jesus and with his people. I have a new family. I'm going to follow Jesus in every area of my life. I'm all in. Hi, I'm Jim and uh, born in Vancouver, raised in North Vancouver. I remember when I was going to elementary school, you know, uh, we all got a mini Bible and we all took that home and uh, we read, but I, I never read the whole thing, but I do remember saying my prayers at night before going to bed. In my teens, I never thought much more about God and then into adulthood, um, you know, I wasn't thinking much and uh, everybody was saying, hey, you're a good guy and everything. And I knew that. But afterwards, uh, I did meet Lisa, my wife now, and uh, we started coming to Willington Church uh, 2019. And uh, we enjoyed it. I enjoy it. I, I know Lisa does too. And right now, Lisa and I were both in the choir. I just want to say I, I believe in God now. I just really enjoy coming here. My life has gotten better now since I've been coming to church and knowing God. Life is better. Everything seems to be going smoothly and things are coming together better. Praise God and amen. Well, thanks, Jim, and I know that you have made your commitment to follow Christ. You, you committed, you confessed your sins, and you put your trust in him that Jesus died on the cross, taking your sins away. Now, do you promise to live the rest of your life following Jesus Christ, to put him first in your life? Yes, I promise. It's yes. my privilege to baptize you, Jim, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I have known Jesus for a long time growing up in a Catholic family. I have participated in many of the sacraments. I left home and went away to school. I became employed and married and adopted two girls. Unfortunately, my ex-wife and I divorced. For a long time, our oldest daughter had mental health problems. However, they continued to worsen and become severe. I was also a single dad, which was difficult, especially dealing with my oldest daughter who started living with me full time. Eventually, my youngest daughter also decided to live with me full time. I started to become overwhelmed as a parent and I reached out to Willingdon Church and many friends. That's when I met Pastor Richard. I also had known and met a devout Christian woman, Mackie, who was extremely supportive for a very long time. 
both Pastor Richard and Mackie encouraged me to seek God and we prayed together very much. I am thankful to God that my oldest daughter started to seek God as well and all of us would often pray together. Unfortunately, my oldest daughter succumbed to her mental illness and passed away about 6.5 months ago. I am thankful to God because although it was very tough raising my daughter, he was able to help me and guide me by answering my prayers. I began to realize that my oldest daughter was suffering so much. However, since her passing, I understand that she is at peace with God. In addition, my youngest daughter and I are also at peace with God. One must understand that it's very difficult to lose your child, but because I love my daughter so much, I am willing to let my oldest daughter go as she is at peace with God. I now have more time to spend with Mackie, who is now my fiance, and we are about to be married in three months, and my youngest daughter. We are now all at peace. I've thought about being baptized for a long time, but with the recent passing of my daughter, I realized that I must at this time commit my life to a merciful, wonderful, and loving God. Therefore, I feel that I should be baptized today. I must trust the Lord with my life and ask for his ongoing guidance through prayer and learning more about him through scripture. I found a very helpful passage from the Bible that I would like to share from the book of Ephesians, chapter two, verses four and five. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we're dead in transgression. It is by the grace of God you have been saved. Hence, I do believe that God does answer our prayers even though we are sinners. I thank God for the peace that he has given to my family. Thank you. My, my brother Rob, it's a pr privilege uh, to stand in this baptismal with you this afternoon and uh, to witness your life and see, even though it's been a difficult year, uh, you've been a blessing to, to me personally and to see your faith grow and grow at trusting God in despite circumstances that are very difficult. Um, so just in front of our whole church congregation here, um, just let's just remind them what baptism is. Christians get baptized, but we baptize uh, based on a confession of faith. So I'm going to ask you three questions. Do you, Rob Baldelli, acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of a savior? You can't save yourself, but only Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead, is sufficient for paying the penalty for your sins. Do you believe that? Yes. Okay. Do you choose to follow Jesus the rest of your life? Yes. On that confession of faith, Rob Baldelli, I'm gonna baptize you in the, name, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. I grew up in a Catholic family, but never came to know Jesus personally. Going through deep emotions during my daughter's baptism and having my wife as a Christian role model, I felt I should give it a try to get to know Jesus personally. My goal was to learn more about the Word of God and to possibly develop a relationship with Him. So I started attending the Sunday service. I then met Pastor Richard, who invited me for chat over coffee. He asked me if I knew what the good news is. Since I did not know the answer, he patiently and graciously explained it to me while also reading and referring me to some Bible verses. That moment was such a turning point for me. I decided to start Freedom Session and under Pastor Richard's leadership and the support of my small group brothers, I learned, realized and felt that in Christ, I am free from my sins. I am forgiven. I have been rescued from darkness and established in the kingdom of light. Colossians 1.13. I now know and feel God is always with us and that I am loved, wanted, and accepted. I am a child of God by his choice. John 1.12. And that I am important. 
God called me as a servant and witness of what He has done in my life. Acts 28, 16 to 18. Hence, my being baptized today means, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for He has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. Isaiah 61, 10. João, do you confess that you are a sinner? And do you believe that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Are you willing to surrender yourself to Jesus and to follow him for the rest of your life? Yes. Upon this confession of your faith, it is my great joy to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Oh, what a blessing privilege it is to, to participate, participate in witnessing the baptisms in these confessions of faith. Church, I encourage you to keep all three of them in your prayers this week. We know that Satan is defeated, but he goes down, but he keeps on fighting. And this could possibly be the worst spiritual week of these people's lives because they have been baptized and Satan knows it. And so we need to pray diligently for their faith and for their endurance this week. Let's pray for them right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for Jim, we pray for Rob, and we pray for Joao. Father, we just, we just thank you for them. We thank you for their confession. We thank you for what you've done this morning in, uh, in blessing them. And uh, we raise up our arms to you, Father. We ask for a hedge of protection around each and every single one of them this week as they will experience uh, spiritual warfare they will experience the darts of the enemy. And so, Father, we pray for that to be abolished. Give them peace. Give them courage. Give them wisdom. But most of all, Father, we just give them the ability to go on their knees, to glorify you, and to honor you through their life and through the commitments that they've made. So, Father, we thank all of this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Wellington Church. So glad to see all of you here today. My name is Jessica, and I'm a grade 11 student here. And since it's an in-service Sunday, I was wondering if we had any students here. <laughs> nice, thank you. If it's your first time, a very special welcome. In the seats in front of you, there's an orange Connect card that you can fill out, and then after the service, you can go through those main doors, and there's a welcome center there. And the team would love to get to know you and get you connected. And so God has carried us in ministry, and we just, for service, um, the invitation to serve is just a very special thing that we could just do for God. And over the years, I've gotten many life group leaders who served us students and witnessed us growing in our faith. And I've also gotten the opportunity to do the same for Kidsmen and the WAM team. And also, as you can see earlier, we had the orchestra today. And you can, if you're musically, have music abilities, you can talk to Nigel or you can contact them at orchestra at willingdon.org. And I just think us having that opportunity is very special to us. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, as Jessica said, uh, we've got plenty of rooms for serving. And for those of you that don't know Jesus, are looking to know about Jesus, or maybe do know Jesus but are fairly new to the family, we have our discovery classes that I encourage you to sign up to, getting to know Jesus, getting to know the church family. And uh, those are great places to, uh, to learn where to serve, where your gifting is, where the Holy Spirit is upon you. And we look forward to you uh, becoming a larger and greater part of our, our church. 
For some of you that don't know me, my name is Mark Lowen. I'm one of the elders here. I'm the elder of finance. And I uh, just want to recap a little bit what was happening in December. Uh, you may have seen uh, one, two, three, or four videos about us and our, our little giving that we were uh, the push at the end of the year. And we were asking <clears throat> for faithfulness and obedience and worship. And God has been glorified. Uh, he brought, uh, he was faithful to us, and we were able to meet our ministry needs for the year. And we praise and thank God for that, all of the glory to him, because he is our provider. And we, we only give a little bit back, and uh, that is just out of our, our worship. And so we want to thank God for that and for honoring us and continuing to work in our family here. Another thing about these first Sundays, we've got our baptisms going on, and the first Sunday is also a Sunday that we dedicate towards special giving to our benevolent fund. I mean, we accept uh, the benevolent donations all the time, but specifically on the first Sunday, we want you to remember, we have this special fund set up to help out the needy, the homeless, uh, those that, have extra, that need extra resources from the church. We've got various ministries out in the community that also do that. We have our, our food hamper, or our food table in the back, as well as in the parking lot, and we've got a food pantry downstairs. And so it's to give a little bit extra, a little bit out of that to help the community that is in need. So I want you to remember that on the first Sundays of each month, which is today as well. So let me just pray for our offering this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the provisions that you give us. We thank you for all that you give us because everything is yours. And we give only a little bit back. And so, Father, I pray that you encourage us to, to be cheerful givers, to be great givers of the blessings that you've given us. And, Father, I just pray that the blessings that you do give us, that they go out to further your kingdom, not only <clears throat> here in the church, but in our community, in our province, and around the world. So, Father, we thank you for that. You are taking care of us, and we want to worship you by giving to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, one final thing is that... Uh, you know, we, we saw prayers answered already about our giving last year. And last week, here's a tangible evidence of God working. Every single one of us know this. Last week, we had a call to prayer for the MAID legislation that was coming down over the next little while. And we were praying that it wouldn't happen. And we were praying for God to show up. And this week, the government announced to postpone that MAID legislation for three years. So we want to thank God and praise Him for that. Keep praying because it is still there, but keep praying and on your knees. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And uh, yeah, we are so thankful for that delay. And we pray for even greater changes in the coming days. God does hear our prayers and he does answer. Um, one of the things that we're able to do because of your generous giving is to uh, invite resource speakers from uh, other parts of the world. And so we've invited Dr. Christopher Ewan to be with us February 17 and 18. That's in two weeks. Um, Dr. Ewan will be addressing the theme of God and sex, gospel conversations on gender, identity, and sexuality. Um, it's a really important conversation in our society, and it's important that we have it here as a church family. So on Saturday morning, the 17th, he'll be conducting a seminar and answering questions like, is sexual identity core to who we are? What's the big deal? This will be the question in the evening, a, a, a talk directed, actually it's going to be interview style, uh, an interactive discussion around the question, what's the big deal? Why do we have to talk about it so much? This is for students and, and young adults. Um, Sunday morning, Dr. Ewan and his mother will be here in the three services, and then right after the third service, there's going to be a really good conversation for parents and grandparents. Uh, Dr. Ewan and his team, they've produced an animated faith-based curriculum for parents and their children. So parents and, ch and, and grandparents, just put that on your calendar and uh, come to that uh, conversation right after the third service. And then Sunday evening will be a public lecture. And the theme of that public lecture is sex, gender, and the image of God. How do we wrap our minds around sexual identity and transgenderism? A huge question in our day. So it's going to be a great weekend. As always, everybody's wel welcome. It's completely free, but we need for you to register. You can do that online. You can do that in the resource center just outside these doors. Please, please register today or as soon as possible because we want to prepare as best we can for 
these um, seminars, these conversations. Okay, today we continue in our sermon series, Shine Like Stars, uh, a different kind of light, and uh, we're going to continue talking about finances for a bit. As you know, we've been talking about it for two weeks, and today the focus is on, on giving. Who is generous is the title of the message. It's an important conversation. We don't talk a lot about money at Willingdon, but it is so much a part of our lives. So we're going to read a text in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 6 to 15. Uh, Jessica is going to come and read that text. Why don't you stand as we read God's Word? The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and all for all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift Jessica um, before you sit down let's just pray so father again we just thank you for preserving your word for us Uh, I thank you that you're present, Jesus, by your Spirit to teach us. I pray that the word that remains with those here would be your word, not my word. And may we understand how to live the good news of who you are and all that you have done for us. We praise you and we thank you for this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you, can may, you may be seated. We're talking about our finances. We're talking about giving, not to induce guilt, but so that we understand more fully who God is and how we should live in light of who he is. So here's a couple of slides that we probably won't find all that encouraging. <laughs> in Canada... The percentage of people giving to charities dropped from 36 to 28 percent between 2010 and 2022. So that statistic is uh, unsettling. But what's happening is this as belief in God declines in Canada, so too giving declines. It's inevitable. Then in 2021, Canadians gave 0.55% of their household income to registered charity, charities. And that is stunning, that in a country as wealthy as Canada, on average, Canadians would give just over half a percent. Why is that? What about those who believe in God? Surely uh, the stats would be much higher. Well. Of all religious affiliations, evangelical Protestants are the most generous. Um, Willingdon is an evangelical church, so we're thankful that there's at least an increase in generosity. Among all evangelicals, 3.2% of household income goes to registered charities. Of the 3.2%, 2.4% to churches, and 0.8% to charities. So evangelicals are almost six times more generous than those who are not evangelical, but should we be content with what we see? Is that good? Is what we see on the screen um, what we would expect from people that have been saved by Jesus Christ 
by grace on no merit of their own? Does it reflect the image of God? Could we say that we're just shining like stars in this generation? As we've seen over the past couple of weeks, one of our biggest mental and spiritual strongholds is our relationship with money. Jesus, he knew this very well. That's why he said, and we read this verse last week, Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So money in and of itself is not, not evil. What God intended to be a blessing in our lives, however, can become something that binds us. Money can be enthroned in our hearts and it can become like a God that we trust to, to give us comfort and security and freedom and status and, and power. Everything that God should be doing in our lives. We should be trusting in Him for all of that. Sometimes we jokingly say, and by the way, those three testimonies were really beautiful, Jim and, and Rob and, and Zhuang. What a beautiful testimony of God's grace in their lives. But sometimes we joke that when we get baptized, we go under, but we hold our wallets above the water. Money was given by God to be an instrument for, his bless, for the blessing of many. So who should inform us? Who should guide us when we think about generosity? Where should we go for inspiration? In our text today, Paul begins with a farming metaphor. <clears throat> this is what he says in verse 6. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So very simple, right? If you sow in a miserly way, you're going to get a miserly harvest. If you sow generously, you're going to reap a great harvest. Our text today, it applies that metaphor to financial giving, but you could also apply the same principle to the use of time, uh, spiritual gifts, leadership, the sowing of gospel seeds. It's a principle, a biblical principle. No farmer says, uh, oh, I wish I would have kept all of my seed in the storehouse for another 10 years. What was I thinking? No. No farmer considers sowing of seed as a loss of seed. You sow seed because by doing that, you get a harvest and you also get seed for the next season. The farmer sows all he can. Paul talks about sowing bountifully. Within that word, bountifully, we have the idea of everything having as its source God. The sowing, the generous sowing is done out of God's grace. It's an expression of who God is. Have you, have you observed how many seeds are produced by a plant or by a tree? This spring, you know, as you leave our parking lot, just observe the seeds coming off the poplar trees. Just an abundance of seed. So here's my first point. God is cheerfully generous. Do you think about God that way? Is that the image you have of God? God is cheerfully generous. He loves to give. When we're open-handed and generous, we reflect his image, his likeness. We invite his blessing. Of course, the greatest blessing of all is not material blessing, it's relationship with God. But we do serve a God who does promise to provide food, drink, and clothing. We talked about that last week. The people of Israel in the Old Testament, they were complaining to God. They were saying that God wasn't providing enough, that he wasn't being faithful. Listen to what God says to them in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there's no more need. God invites them to put them to the test. 
Sometimes our heart reflects the heart of Jacob. Jacob is an Old Testament character. Uh, Jacob, he deceived his brother Esau and then fled, fled from Esau. And as he was fleeing, God appeared to him, revealed himself to him, and and promised to bless him. And how did uh, Jacob respond? I think the way that he responds reflects uh, the human condition. He says this, God, if you're faithful to your word, and you protect me, and you provide for me, then I'll make you my God, and I'll give you a tenth. Isn't that sobering? I'll be so generous that I'll make you my God and I'll give you a tenth. You see, when we give, we're not bargaining with God. We're not trying to manipulate him to be generous. He is generous, exceedingly generous. Paul writes in verse 7, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So we give as we've determined in our hearts. We give as an act of worship. I think sometimes we come to church with our hands raised, but then we live tight-fisted, and when we're tight-fisted, we're not reflecting the image of a God who is generous. God doesn't want us to give begrudgingly or under compulsion, under pressure. He doesn't want us to give as if it's a tax paid because it's demanded by him. We're to give cheerfully because God just delights in being generous. It's the way he is. We should be eager to dethrone money in our hearts and eager to have God's generosity rule every area of our lives. In a sermon here at Willingdon a few years ago, the pastor of Northview Community Church in Abbotsford, Pastor Mark Birch, he said this, I'll quote him, the very essence of the gospel we preach and sing about is a gospel of generosity. If I'm not a generous person, it's because I don't get the gospel. If I'm not a generous person, it's because I don't get the gospel. I haven't grasped the gospel. I haven't understood it. You see, being a follower of Jesus means seeking God, his kingdom, and his righteousness. And when we're doing that, we want to be like him. The Holy Spirit works in our hearts and conforms us to his, the likeness of Jesus. We want to surrender every area of our lives to him, including our finances. A few weeks ago, uh, there was a public lecture here led by Dr. Rick Gosen, a member of our church, And uh, he used some really helpful slides. He said this, the way that most people structure their financial lives is like this slide here. Number one, my lifestyle. I have to secure enough money to maintain my lifestyle, the way that I want to live. Then two, I've got to pay those debts. Number three, I have to pay taxes because I live in Canada. And four, I hope I can save something. And then last, okay, if there's something left over, I'll give. And what happens then is we end up giving the crumbs, if we give it all. If the Canadian statistic is the average is 0.55%, there's a lot of people in Canada not giving a cent right? So most Canadians live according to that slide. Giving is last, the last thought. When we follow that pattern, we we think that we can only give when we have more than enough. And when does the day come that we have more than enough? I'll come back to that. When I was in college, um, I didn't have a lot of money to spare. If you don't come from a wealthy family and your parents you know, are paying your tuition, room, and board, that wasn't my case. In my case, I had enough money to pay tuition, room, and board. I worked my way through school. And uh, 
One day I had this conversation with my anthropology professor, and he looked at me and he said, so Ray, do you give anything? And I said, no, I don't have any money. And I truly thought that that was a fair answer, that I was okay. And he just looked at me and he said, you know what? If, Ray, if you don't learn to give out of your poverty, you will probably never give. He was right. If we don't learn to give out of our poverty, we will probably never give, because giving, it's a mindset. It's a way of viewing God. It's a way of trusting God, no matter what our financial circumstance. So, if you're a student, elementary, high school, university, wrestle with that. If God is our provider, there is never a time when we can't be generous. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, here's the basis of what I'm saying. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Did you notice the repetition of all? Five times. All grace, all sufficiency, all things, all times, every good work. Every in the original is all. Five times. So the point is really clear, right? God is fully able to, sur- to, to provide more than enough so that having more than enough in all things at all times, we will be able to overflow in every good work. <laughs> the abundant grace that we receive just generates an abundance of good works. The scriptures teach us to structure our lives in this way. The right side of the screen. First of all, start by giving generously. You don't wait till the end of the month or the end of the year. Why? Because your confidence is in God, who provides abundantly. I trust God, God has been good to me out of gratitude, I will give, and I will trust him for the harvest. Two, save. That's just financial wisdom. Put some money aside every month. Three, pay those debts. Four, pay those taxes. It's hard, but do it. And then five, think about your lifestyle after you've done the first four. Live below your means and be content. Too often we're living above our means and thinking in the first place about sustaining our lifestyle. And if we think that way, then at the end of the day, there's very little to give. It's just crumbs. The question we have to ask ourselves, if we're not living in the biblical way, have we understood the gospel? I'll talk a bit, a bit about that a bit more in a, in a few minutes. The main point is this. We can so generously because of who God is. That's what the scriptures teach us. We can trust him with generous sowing. We can have confidence that he rewards generosity with an abundant harvest so that we can, we can be even more generous. If you're struggling to live in a biblical way, I would recommend to you the course being offered at Willingdon School of the Bible and Ministry by Dr. Gosen. It starts this Wednesday. It's called Financial Wisdom. Uh, go through that course. It'll help you think about your finances in a new way. And I'll just take the opportunity that there's a few other courses, Old Testament Survey, or Panorama, being taught by Dr. Brian Bourne, uh, a great Old Testament course, um, one on mission by Pastor John Best and John Dick, and a third course on Christian theology that is being organized by Dr. Bourne, and other pastors will participate in the teaching of that course. Four great courses. Take advantage of the opportunity. Back to the sermon. The point is this. God is lavishly generous. He supplies abundantly. Think about a few things. God forgives all our sins, past, present, and future, not just a few of them. God provides peace that surpasses understanding. God gives hope in abundance. 
God provides abundant seeds for sowing. God definitely does not have a scarcity mindset. God definitely does not have a scarcity mindset. If we live with a scarcity mindset and we think that resources are limited, that there's probably not for enough for us and for others, then we're just not understanding who God is. About 10 years ago, I thought I needed a break. I'd been working long hours, working hard for a long time, so I went up to a log cabin on Elligook Lake, which is in central British Columbia, near Vanderhoof, if you know your BC geography. It's remote, so um, I was flying in on a float plane, and as we were descending toward the lake, the pilot said to me, you know what, Ray, if you go fishing, you're going to catch a fish every 15 minutes. I thought, ah, he's messing with me because, you know, he knows I'm from the city. What do I know? And, uh, and then he said this. He says, and if you do go fishing, watch out for the crazy loon. Uh, and now I know he's messing with me. So I'm at the lake, and I'm observing, and the fish are jumping all day long. There's an abundance of fish. So I, after a few days, I decide to go fishing. I get in the boat, and I had noticed that the eagle was uh, fishing where the stream entered the lake. So I went, parked my boat right at that sp spot. I threw my line into the water, and as soon as I did that, the crazy loon shows up. I catch a fish. As soon as I catch a fish, he swims under the water, takes the fish right from my line. Incredible, right? God has given the loon all of the ability in the world to fish day and night. There was an abundance of fish. Enough fish for his lifetime and the lifetime of a thousand loons. Why did he want my fish? That's the definition of greed. So I thought I'll outsmart him. So I start trolling. And trolling, I caught a fish literally every 15 minutes. And that crazy loon followed me all over the lake. That is a scarcity mindset. He thinks that there's not going to be enough for him. Sometimes do our lives reflect the life of that crazy loon? Think about the hoarding during the pandemic. I won't talk about that. John D. Rockefeller, he was the founder of the Standard Oil Company. He was the first billionaire of the United States of America. At one point, the richest man in the world. And a reporter asked him this question, how much money is enough? How much is, is enough? And he replied very calmly, just a little bit more. And maybe we point the finger at him and say, well, you know, look at that, billionaire. The Canadian magazine Maclean's did a study some years ago asking this question, how much more money, how much more do you need for you to have enough? And the, the answer across the board, among the poor, the middle income, and the rich was this, just 10% more. So no matter how wealthy you are, whether you're poor, in the middle, or, you know, rich, our human tendency is to think we need 10% more. Why? <laughs> W.M. McGregor writes this, A selfish man is never rich. What haunts his mind at every turn is the dread of having too little for himself. Now, if we know God, we think differently. Jesus teaches us to think differently. We don't follow the pathway of the normal way. You know, I need to maintain my lifestyle, and, and then I'll pay some debts and maybe save a bit for myself, and if there's anything left over, I'll give, maybe. 
Jesus teaches us to think differently. We know that God provides abundantly. We know that when God provides resources, He provides more than what people need so that they can be generous with what they've received. We cannot outgive God. If there's nothing else that you remember today, remember this. You cannot outgive God. Just imagine the absurdity of the thought that somehow you and I will be more generous than the creator of the universe. It's an absurdity to have that thought. That somehow we are going to outgive God. The church of Corinth was quite wealthy. And the church of Corinth lived in a culture that taught that it was an absurdity to give to the poor. That's just what people learned growing up. Paul encourages the church at Corinth to think different, differently, and he goes back to the Old Testament, to God's Word. He quotes Psalm 112, verse 9 in 2 Corinthians 9, 9. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. So God, in his righteousness, he cares for the poor. And if we're his people, if we're following Jesus, then we too will give to the poor and expect nothing in return. Paul continues in 2 Corinthians 9.10, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of righteousness. Do you notice the progression there of supply, multiply, increase? God provides seeds plentifully. He multiplies seeds for sowing. He increases the harvest. So when we give, we give believing in that God. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the New Testament story of the little boy who came to Jesus with five loaves and two fish, right? It's in all four Gospels. So there's a large, hungry crowd. No one has food except for a little boy. Or at least, he's the only one mentioned. Maybe other people in the crowd were actually hiding their food. He offers his five loaves and two fish. And what does Jesus do with it? He multiplies it. He feeds 5,000 men plus women and children, probably about 10,000 people. Now, that boy had a story to tell, didn't he? You see, if we don't give generously, we'll never have a story to tell. At least not in the area of giving. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 9, 11, and 12, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. Paul uses the language of the ministry of this service. That's priestly service. That's why we say that giving is an act of worship. It's God acting through us for the common good. In the context, Paul had in mind a collection for the Jerusalem church. The Jerusalem church was in dire need. And so Paul, in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, he holds up as an example to this church in Corinth, the church in Macedonia. The Macedonians had given beyond their means. Why? Because they had come to understand the gospel. And their giving resulted in a harvest of praise and thanksgiving. Okay, you might be saying, okay, Pastor Ray, get practical. You know, tell us how much we should give. (laughs) What does Willingman teach? Well, we encourage our members, our attendees, to give generously as an act of worship. It's not a membership tax. Well, should should followers of Jesus tithe? Listen to Randy Elkhorn. The tithe is God's historical method to get us on the path of giving. It is unhealthy to view tithing as a place to stop, but it can be a good place to start. I detest legalism. Some people will ask, 
Well, do I tithe on the gross or the net? For asking that question, we've missed the point. What motivates us to talk about generosity at Willingdon? Is it so that we can have a bigger budget? No, it's actually not. It's so that we as God's people can come to an understanding of who He is, worship Him with our giving, be conformed to His likeness, be a blessing, and receive His blessing, live under His blessing, live under His favor. And then through our giving, see God glorified here at Willingdon and around the world, so that through our giving, there might be a harvest of praise and thanksgiving all over the world. Look at the way that our passage ends, verse 15. Thanks be to God for His in, in, inexpressible gift. Uh, Paul, he's worshiping God here for an indescribable gift. Which gift? The gift of Jesus Christ. Listen to what God did. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? The father gave his only son. He gave what was most precious to him. And then 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Jesus gave up his treasure in heaven so that we might become his treasure. All of the grace that we have received flows from the cross at Calvary, the solution to a miserly spirit, to being tight-fisted, the solution to a scarcity mindset is to see Jesus. Jesus gave it all. He gave it all. All of our giving is done in light of this indescribable gift. So do we understand what Jesus has done for us? Have we grasped the gospel? Listen to pastor theologian Tim Keller. They often ask me, you don't think that now in the New Testament believers are absolutely required to give away 10%, do you? I shake my head, no. And they give a sigh of relief. But then I quickly add, I'll tell you why you don't see the tithing requirement laid out clearly in the New Testament think. Have we received more of God's revelation, truth, and grace than the Old Testament believers or less? Usually there's an uncomfortable silence. Are we more debtors to grace than they were or less? Did Jesus tithe his life and blood to save us or did he give it all? Tithing is a minimum standard for Christian believers. We certainly wouldn't want to be in a position of giving away less of our income than those who had so much less of an understanding of what God did to save them. Referring to the people of the Old Testament. You see, how we deal with our finances, it becomes a litmus test around our understanding of the gospel. Do we understand what Jesus has done for us? Do we know who God is? Do we know whom we're serving, whom we're following? You see, God is cheerfully generous. He definitely does not have a scarcity mindset. Praise God! Can you imagine following someone that had a scarcity mindset? That you had to bargain with, manipulate? That's so far from who God is. Look at Jesus. Jesus gave it all. He gave it all. So as we come to the Lord's table, may we, in response and out of gratitude, worship Jesus with all that we are and all that we have. You see, through Jesus, we receive the gift of forgiveness of sins and not just forgiveness for a few of our sins, a portion. No, all of our sin. 
Through Jesus, we've received the gift of eternal life. Not just life for a few days, life everlasting. We serve a God who is abundant in his grace. And out of his abundance, we have received grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. So in light of that, let's come to the table and worship Jesus and thank Jesus for who he is and for all that he has done for us. Amen? Let's just take a moment for silent prayer. So, Father, we come before you and we just thank you again that you, by your grace, have drawn us to yourself. We thank you for sending your only Son, Jesus, for our salvation. Jesus, we thank you again for coming, for becoming one of us and being faithful to the mission entrusted to you by the Father. It's because of your faithfulness, your righteousness, your goodness that we're here today at your table. We worship you and we thank you. Forgive us for the way that we so easily stray and trust in other people or other things. Forgive us for the way that sometimes we can be miserly, selfish, thinking about ourselves first. God, we ask that your Holy Spirit continue your good work in us. We thank you that you're faithful even when we're not. And in this moment, we just renew our commitment to you and to your people and to the things of your kingdom. May we live for your glory. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'd invite the uh, communion service to come forward at this time. On the night when uh, he was betrayed, Jesus uh, took bread and he gave thanks to God for the bread. And then he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus' body broken so that we might be one with God, so that we might be one with God with one another as followers of Jesus. And so we give thanks and invite Pastor Richard to come thank for the bread. Lord Jesus, Thank you that you took on flesh in the incarnation, that you came to earth and you dwelt among us, fully God, fully man. And because of that wonderful truth, when you generously chose to lay your life down for us, it was deemed a suitable sacrifice. And we thank you that in the incarnated Christ, that you were the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 53 that says, he suffered for our transgressions. He was pierced for our iniquities and by his wounds we are healed. So we thank you for laying your body down.
body of Christ broken for us. Let's participate together. In the same way, after supper, uh, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus' blood shed so that we might be forgiven, completely forgiven. And invite Elder Danny Lee to pray for the cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you for opening the way for us to enter into a new relationship of love with God through all that Jesus has done. So today, as we drink this cup, please remind us of the blood of the covenant which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. May the sacrificial love and power of Jesus Christ strengthen our hope for salvation and fellowship at the table with Him in heaven for those of us who believe in Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
grace that brought me to the fold of God. Sing the chorus. blood of Christ shed for us. Let's participate together. Jesus, we are so grateful that you came, that we, we might have life and have it to the full. And we thank you that salvation in you is complete. The day is coming when you will return and we will see you face to face and we will join you at that great banquet and you will again raise the cup. Oh, we look forward to that day, Jesus. Thank you for that sure hope. And as we wait, Lord, may we bring you glory. May we bring you honor in all that we say, in all that we do. May your name be be glorified, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, you can stand and pass these cups to the aisles. Uh, they'll be collected, and let's join CJ in, in worshiping Jesus, thanking him. I'd invite um, elders and pastors and life group leaders to come forward for prayer as well. Yes, and as they come, let's sing that chorus one more time together. Amen. Thank you for leading us, CJ. And uh, again, elders, pastors, life group leaders, come forward for prayer. Um, we, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he talks about giving there in the middle of the letter. And at the end, he ends with grace and love and the fellowship of the Spirit. So I want to leave you with that word today. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all as you live generously for his glory. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.